Typical tiles who have been working with moisture, ventilation, and building envelopes since 1996. As national sales consultant for Thermostore LLC based in Madison, Wisconsin, Bill has experience dealing with a wide range of moisture problems and developing solutions that address them. He earned a BA and MBA degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but occasionally pretends to be an engineer. He has presented to contractors and events at the national, state, and local le levels. Please welcome Phil Connell. Thanks, Tony. Can you hear me okay? Does everything seem to be working? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Well, thanks, thanks for being here this morning. Um, appreciate your time, and uh, I'd like to make sure that everybody uses their time as effectively as possible. So as we're working through the material here, you find uh, there's something else you'd rather see or something else you'd rather do, uh, feel free to get up, come and go as you need to, and uh, we'll work through it and, and uh, see where we can go. So thanks again for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, just a quick introduction of the topics that we're going to cover today. Um, we work uh, in, in the field that I work, we do a lot of uh, evaluation of moisture control solutions, um, trying to figure out uh, what's going on. A lot of things based on comfort and um, in, in our business, understanding basic psychrometrics helps us understand loads on the building. Um, understanding how loads work and how they interact with the equipment that's put in the home, HVAC equipment is what we're going to talk about mostly, um, helps us understand uh, how that equipment's going to perform and that helps us understand what's going to happen in the, in the built environment. So we're going to kind of work through some of those things and I, and I hope you find some, some takeaways along the, along the way. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on, on cooling season specifically, and I'm going to refer to ACA Manual J relatively often, and my hope is to present some of the challenges that the heating and air conditioning contractors face in their world that I'm sure you guys face in your world as well and kind of see how these things are, are interrelated. So I'll refer to ACA Manual J often. I think it's just important for you all to know what it is. It's not, this isn't a class on Manual J. Um, but that's the manual that HVAC contractors use to determine loads on homes. And uh, I think some of the, some of the uh, loads that Manual J gives them and, and the way Manual J is designed has really laid out some challenges for HVAC contractors and how we control moisture and indoor air quality in homes. Uh, so just real quickly, we're going to talk about uh, comfort, uh, psychrometrics, uh, heating and cooling loads design loads versus real life loads and some of the challenges that that provides. That's kind of a quick overview of where we're going. So if it sounds all right, let's get started. Um, thermal comfort, we talk a lot mostly about comfort in our business, although we do talk about other things like health and durability of the structure and that type of thing. Thermal comfort is primarily a function of temperature and relative humidity. Air speed also affects that a little bit. Um, humidity is important to comfort because it, it affects the body's uh, ability to cool itself. When we get too warm, we, we, we sweat. A layer of moisture on our skin that evaporates and it's evaporative cooling that, that cools the body off. So high humidity conditions uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's experienced comfort problems here in Vegas. I know several people, okay, I got a few nods and things like that. We've had some some co-workers request uh, humidifiers in their rooms to sleep a little more comfortably, so it, it, it really is important. Uh, because comfort is mainly a function of temperature and relative humidity, it's often put on a psychrometric chart that shows us where we're the most comfortable. So this is an ASHRAE psychrometric chart. You can see kind of three shaded areas. The darkest shade is an overlap of the two zones. Uh, ASHRAE publishes a summertime uh, comfort curve that looks like this and a winter time curve that looks like this. So ASHRAE assumes that we're going to dress a little bit differently in the winter time than we do in the summer time and therefore the winter curve is a little bit cooler uh, than the summer curve. Um, summer curve is a little bit warmer. Temperatures um, range, just in case you can't quite see it here, this is 70 degrees, this is 80 degrees. So in, in here we're somewhere around uh, you know, 68 uh, to 75 degrees, something like that. Uh, relative humidities top out at 60%. ASHRAE doesn't like it any more humid than 60% because um, 
not only of comfort issues, but also that gets into our health issues, durability, things like that, durability of the structure. And the driest they recommend it is actually around 30%, although technically they'll say a little bit drier is okay as long as we don't get condensation in, um, or sorry, a little bit more humid is okay as long as we don't get condensation in places we don't want it, cool surfaces like windows or wall cavities and things like that. Um, in order to determine loads on the house uh, or the structure, um, ACA uses these interior design conditions right here. So the targets for determining loads on structures assume that in the summertime we want to maintain 77 degrees and 45 percent relative humidity in the house and in the wintertime 71 and 30 percent relative humidity. Those are the targets that we look for. Um, that ACA Manual J actually recommends. Um, I'm going to talk just a little quickly here about the psychrometric chart. We use it in our business just to help us understand the relationships between all these things. So I'm going to introduce it to you and, and we've actually created a little bit of a shortcut that we'll give you to in case you find the information useful or want to take it along with you. Um, on a psychrometric chart, uh, the definition actually of, of of temperature, I think we all know what it is, but you know, so there's some definitions. I, I'm not going to read through them because I think we all know what temperature is, but it's located on the psychrometric chart down on this horizontal axis down here. This is 50, this is 110 degrees, uh, just moves, increases from left to right along the bottom of the, of the psychrometric chart. Um, relative humidity, uh, again, is a term that, that everybody hears fairly often. We do find that there's a little bit of confusion about what it actually means. Um, a couple of definitions here for manual J and then some more common definitions, but it's the degree, degree of saturation of moist air measured as a percentage. Uh, it's kind of a simple definition. A little more complicated definition of relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in a sample of air compared to the maximum amount of water vapor it can hold at any given temperature and it's always expressed uh, in a percentage. The relationship between temperature and relative humidity uh, is a critical one and I think that's the one that kind of throws people off mostly. Um, while it's not technically accurate, um, you know, if there are any um, purists or engineers out in the group, don't, don't call me on the technical parts of it, but basically water can hold more air as it gets warmer. So um, because warmer air can hold more water, uh, that causes these curved lines that we see on the psychrometric chart. So psychrometrics, uh, on the psychrometric chart, the relative humidity lines have this sort of sweeping curve to them as they move from right to left. So there's a 10% line, 20% line, all the way up, we've cut a few off of them, but the saturation curve is here at 100% relative humidity. And so it's that relationship between temperature and relative humidity that gives us these really confusing sort of swooping lines on a psychrometric chart. Um, we tend to simplify things a little bit, uh, in terms of what relative humidity looks like by talking about you know cups with water or containers with with water in them so um, if you have a 12 ounce glass and you've got six ounces of water in it you've got 50 percent relative humidity so it's just a, a, a relationship of how much water is actually in the air compared to how much it can hold well i'm going to come back to this example here in a few minutes um, to to fill in a couple other blanks uh, we hear about dew point a lot as well, uh, and that's the other thing that we tend to uh, talk about in the work that we do. Um, dew point is the temperature at which water vapor condenses um, at a given absolute humidity and pressure. So relative humidity is relative to the temperature. Uh, dew point is a measure of absolute humidity. There are a couple other measurements as well, but it tells you how much actual water is in, is in the air. Another definition is the temperature at which air becomes completely saturated with water. So if you take a given sample of air, uh, say in a bottle or something like that, it's got a certain temperature and relative humidity. As you cool it down, uh, the temperature drops, the relative humidity rises, and at the point where you get 100% relative humidity, that's your dew point. Dew point is red on the psychrometric chart on these uh, on this vertical axis over here. Sometimes it's put over here, but it's on most psychrometric charts, it's over on this side. Uh, and so that's where you find dew point on the psychrometric chart. Let me take a peek. I'm gonna go back to this example, bear with me just for a second. 
um, and, and add dew point in. Um, so let's go back to this example here. Uh, six ounces of water in a 12 ounce glass. Six ounces of water would be considered the dew point. Uh, the temperature is considered, is, you can relate to the size of the glass and the relative humidity is the percentage. So you can see with this example, these two examples here, the dew point is the same or the amount of water in the two glasses is the same. You can see that if the temperature is related to the size of the container, uh, this temperature would be warmer than the other. So here would be an example of a situation where if we took six ounces of water in a nine ounce glass, uh, if the temperature is related to the size of the glass, if we simply warm that up a little bit, we don't change the actual amount of water or the dew point, but we do change the relative humidity as we change the capacity of air to hold water. So you can see that the relative humidity actually drops in that case. So I hope that helps a little bit create uh, some um, uh, additional understanding or ways that you can explain dew point, temperature, relative humidity to people if you're out there working with that kind of thing. Um, the most common place we see dew point is when you've got uh, something you take out of the refrigerator, it's cold, or the freezer, condensation or frost forms depending on what's going on. Essentially any surface that's below dew point will have condensation on it. So if we got a can of soda or probably beer is more appropriate for Vegas um, something like that, bring it out of the refrigerator. If you've got design load conditions inside 55 degree dew point, um, okay. if that surface of the can is below 55 degrees, you'll get the condensation showing up. So that is a quick just overview of the way that we tend to use psychrometrics. I hope that helps a little bit. I'm going to build on this later on in the presentation and help you understand um, why we think it's important. Um, I'm going to run through just a couple of quick examples. Um, using the manual J interior design conditions, uh, 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity and, and figure out how we can find what the dew point is in those situations. Um, so here's our psychrometric chart with all, all the bars, uh, all the lines sort of lined up, sorry for the quality there, I hope you can see it all right. Uh, but basically we start down here, if we want to find the dew point of 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity, we find the 75 degree line. Uh, draw a vertical line up to where we see 50% relative humidity. We mark that point, carry it on over and read the dew point there, about 55 degree dew point. I had a couple of typos on this particular slide that's on your USB drive. So if you see things that don't quite match up, it's because I don't know how to type, but this, this one is right, so sorry about that. Uh, so interior design conditions uh, for summertime for ACA manual trays, 55 degree dew point. In the winter time, if we're using 70 degrees, 30% relative humidity, we run through the same exercise, 70 degrees on the bottom, bring it up to the 30% relative humidity curve and read that over and get about a 37 degree dew point. So it kind of shows you a little bit about how those interactions work. You probably know it all already, but um, uh, this is the way we tend to use these types of things uh, in, in the work that we do. Um, We've actually put it into a little bit simpler form that's kind of fun to carry around and use. It's, it's interactive. Um, when, when we first put it together, I could actually read the numbers on it. These days I have to use my glasses to do it, so I'm thinking maybe we need to come up with a little bit bigger version, maybe fold out or, or something like that so we can figure out how it works. But essentially, if, if you've all got one of these, you're, you're certainly welcome to come get one. If you don't, uh, stop by uh, our booth over at the ACCA show if you don't have one. But it just kind of goes through those same uh, conditions here on a, on a little bit of a wheel that's easier to use. And essentially what you would do, if everybody's got one and you want to follow along, is start with the temperature on the, the red dial, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I usually just line that up with the little um, orange slider or swinging plastic thing, whatever that thing's called, and then line up a relative humidity behind it. So if we're looking at uh, 70 degrees and uh, what was our condition before? Let's do 70 degrees, 50% relative humidity. And then you read your little, uh, read relative humidity dew point down in the window. Mine says 50. You can also read it in grains per pound. Did I do that right? Do I still have, do I still have typos on my slide? Because so I came up with 55% 55 degree dew point. 
Well, I better get that figured out. So anyway, that's how you can use your, your little dew point wheel. It also reads in grains per pound and you can do some uh, 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 calcul um, degree centigrade is on there as well. So temperature relative, humidity, dew point, grains per pound on your little wheel there. So I hope I didn't confuse anybody. I kind of confused myself a little bit. Uh, so I apologize for that. I'm not sure how that works. But my chart here says 70 degrees, 50% relative humidity is a 50 degree dew point. Let's do the next one at 70 and 30 and see how that works out. 70 degrees on the red scale, 30% relative humidity on the back. And that one works out 37 degree dew point. So I apologize for having some uh, confusion in my slides. I actually changed that one, so maybe the one on the USB drive is, is right, and I changed it because I was confused. 70 and 50. 70 and 50. 75 and 50 is the interior design. That's what I got wrong on this one. Okay. So thanks. Thanks for keeping me, thanks for keeping me honest. I appreciate that. Sorry for the confusion, uh, but I hope you, if you, if you uh, want one of those, grab one. We've also put out recently a, um, an app for your iPhones and iPods, if you, iPads, I suppose iPods don't work. Um, iPhones, iPads that you can dial in, temperature relative humidity, it'll show you dew point and a couple other things. So we've got some things out there uh, as well that'll help you do that. I'm gonna transition a little bit and talk about how some of that information that we just talked about is useful uh, as we talk about uh, design loads on a space. And really where I'm heading with this is, is some of the challenges that, that um, even a ACA manual J calculated uh, air conditioning and cooling and heating system really has some challenges in providing indoor environments that, that are comfortable and healthy. Um, so we know what the interior conditions are that we want to maintain based on the design loads, interior design loads that, uh, that manual J presented earlier. Um, and then we basically look at what the outside loads are and that helps us determine what the, what the equipment needs to get done. So there are a couple different loads that Manual J talks about. There are the design loads and then extreme loads and part load conditions. Design loads are the ones that are used for equipment sizing calculations. Extreme loads don't happen very often so they're not talked about a lot. Part load conditions happen often. Um, they're not talked a lot about either. Um, Design loads are based on the standard indoor conditions of temperature and relative humidity that we just talked about and local weather data that looks like this. Um, that's probably hard to see um, in a lot of parts of the room, so I apologize for that. But basically what it goes through is it talks about the location, uh, the elevation. Uh, they have some size uh, or some uh, elevation load uh, adjustments that they make during some of the calculations. There's a latitude column here that helps determine um, amount of shading that a foot of overhang will, will, will provide, things like that. Um, heating drive bulb, that's the design condition, outside heating, uh, the cooling drive bulb, the quince and wet bulb, which just tells you how much moisture is in the air when the dry bulb is at its maximum, and then design grains and another, a few other things like that. Design grains is basically the difference in moisture between inside and outside conditions. So this is the weather data that goes into figuring those things. The, the biggest uh, takeaway from that table is that um, the winter uh, design is, are the design conditions, the outside design conditions in terms of temperatures and relative humidities. The winter heating design load is what they call a 99% dry bulb. Uh, and again, this is uh, how HVAC contractors would typically size uh, according to industry best practice a uh, heating and cooling system. 99% dry bulb means that the outside temperature will be colder only 1% of the time. Uh, so the outdoor temperature is actually warmer 99% of the time. So when contractors go to size equipment, they basically look at what uh, the almost worst case temperature is, but not quite. Not the extreme load, but just the next one over. Um, so it's called a 1% dry bulb. Similarly, in the summer we have um, a 1% dry bulb temperature outside. So essentially we design air conditioning systems uh, so that uh, the outside temperature is warmer only 1% of the time and it's cooler about 99% of the time. Um, and then the outside wet bulb is the average wet bulb condition that's expected with that warmer temperature, the 1% the dry bulb uh, temperature. Uh, 
Manual J then assumes that the, the loads on the building envelope uh, are made up of uh, sensible loads based on inside and outside conditions and latent load based on inside and outside conditions and that's what, what HVAC contractors use to size equipment. Manual J is, is um, also concerned a lot about oversizing of equipment. Um, we already looked at the design loads they use. They use pretty aggressive uh, load conditions to calculate capacities. And uh, oversizing equipment is a challenge and, and they don't recommend it because of a variety of reasons. You know, the equipment's more expensive, uh, it tends to short cycle, you need bigger um, duct work system to handle the bigger, uh, bigger low air flow loads that the uh, equipment would use. Uh, creates pockets of stagnant air sometimes. In the summertime, it degrades humidity control in the cooling season. We're gonna focus on that one a little bit, but Manual J is concerned about oversizing. So what, what Manual J recommends is size according to the Manual J calculations and don't oversize on purpose. Um, when you look at the ability of uh, the system to remove moisture, that last example here, uh, degrades humidity control during the cooling season. The reason that happens is because when an air conditioner comes on, its uh, sensible capacity jumps relatively quickly, but its latent removal capacity doesn't start for a while. And this is one of the reasons that oversizing an air conditioner uh, is a challenge in terms of controlling uh, moisture. So essentially when an air conditioner comes on, the first thing that happens is the coil has to get cold. And so that takes a little while to do. Uh, as noted in this red graph here. But in order to remove moisture and start actually doing some drying, it has to get not only cold, but it has to get wet. And then after it gets wet, moisture has to drip off and go down the drain. And that doesn't happen for a while. So one of the dangers of oversizing um, an air conditioner is that uh, it comes on, cools the space very quickly, doesn't do any drying, shuts off, and that continues to happen. The challenge with this is that this happens in part load conditions as well. And that's one of the, I think that's one of the challenges that even a perfectly designed air conditioning system struggles with. Um, another challenge with air conditioners is, is as air conditioners um, become more energy efficient uh, in terms of sear ratings and things like that, um, air conditioning manufacturers have done a lot of different things to try to get, uh, get those numbers as high as they can. And sometimes that affects the amount of moisture that they remove. This is a slide that shows that um, after the compressor shuts off of an air conditioning cycle, the fan continues to run. Air conditioning manufacturers like that a lot because that's essentially free cooling. You know, the, coal, the coil's still cold from the air conditioning cycle. Uh, the challenge with it is it is also wet. And so what happens is the compressor comes on for a while and shuts off. Uh, the capacity of, of the, you know, it starts cooling right away as the red bars indicate. Um, it starts removing some water after a while as this indicates, but then when the, when the compressor shuts off and the fan continues to run, you've got a very wet coil with water on it that just blows air back into the structure. And so we've sacrificed some of our moisture control for an energy efficiency rating. Um, this also would happen if you were doing constant fan operation during a, during a cooling cycle as well. Um, part load performance is something that, uh, that we think is very important but doesn't get a lot of play in Manual J. Um, it does state that part load days are more important than design load days but it says that the solution to that is to actually just go ahead and size according to Manual J in the first place. And uh, throughout the rest of the presentation, I wanna work on some, I wanna create some graphs that show why we think this is a bigger problem um, than, than what I personally feel Manual J gives credit for. I, I appreciate Manual J because they've really got a lot of, a lot of things right, and their challenge really is to design systems that, uh, that can get installed, um, at a reasonable price and work very well. And I think it does a good job that in doing that. But we wanted to point out for this audience why we think there are really some challenges left to address in a lot of situations. Toward the back end of Manual J, you find a couple of load graphs that look like this. Um, innocent enough looking, looking charts, but I think there's enough information on here that uh, really gets to the heart of the matter. So what I'd like to do is just show you the charts as they look 
uh, in the book and then kind of break them down and build them up again so that we can see what's really going on. So I'm going to start with a graph that looks like this. Uh, this is basically just the sensible load on a house or any, I guess it could be any structure essentially. Um, BTUs in thousands along this axis here. Uh, this is the outside temperature on this axis here. And so basically as the outside temperature increases, the load on the house increases and I think that makes sense. We want to maintain, maintain a, a certain temperature and relative humidity in the space. But as it gets hotter outside, uh, we've got more work to do. So this is just a graph of the sensible load on a typical structure with varying outside conditions. <coughs> and that was one of the graphs, uh, one of the lines shown on those, on those original charts. Um, the next line I want to add is the capacity of the air conditioning system. And installed capacity of an air con conditioning system actually has a, a negative slope to it. Um, because in cooler conditions, the air conditioner does a better job of discharging heat out into the atmosphere. So your outside condenser sits outside. Uh, heat gets off the condenser a lot faster when it's cool out as opposed to when it's warm out. So as things get warmer outside, the installed capacity of your, relative, of your air conditioning system actually drops here a little bit. And if we've done our ACA manual J calculation right, we get an intersection here of install capacity at design load conditions. And that's kind of the goal of, of manual J is to get that to happen. So um, this is kind of the picture that we try to create with our systems. And the rest of the, the lines that we add in are gonna show you where, where things can fall apart. Um, this sensible load line here, the red one, assumed that it was sunny outside. Uh, Loads on a house can vary quite a bit based on whether it's sunny or it's not sunny. So if we draw another line in here, and that's again another line that's provided in those original charts, uh, this is a sensible load sunny day and this is sensible load cloudy day. So you can see how our uh, cloudy day uh, affects the sensible load on, on, a, on a structure. We've shifted our line over here, uh, probably not a huge deal yet. We still probably have enough capacity on our air conditioning system to be to be comfortable, so we're in good shape. If we add in a, a latent load line, things start to get a little bit more interesting. So the purple line that I just added in was the latent load on a house, just the moisture load on a house. And you notice that moisture loads um, don't increase as dramatically as sensible loads do, but the slope of the line and the extent of the line looks a little bit different. So in a condition like this, we actually see where uh, this is a 65 degree point where at 65 degrees outside we may actually have some sensible load. This would be like a condition of 65 degrees and raining outside. It's, it's humid, it's very humid, but um, there's no sensible load on the house. Uh, if there were some sensible load, we would have a lot of capacity to work on it, but there isn't a lot of sensible load. So this is a red flag condition for controlling temperature, or for controlling moisture in a space. Um, is you look at when there's sensible loads but no, or sorry, there's latent loads, moisture loads, but no, no temperature loads, no sensible loads to remove. And you can see how that line goes like this. Uh, the interesting part of this line here is that that's made up of, that's a total load, that's made up of sensible and latent. So the capacity of our air conditioners is usually somewhere around, um, you know, 75% uh, sensible and 25% latent. They want to get those numbers up as high as they can and have it do as much sensible as possible in order to, uh, to provide as much cooling. So things start to get a little bit interesting when you find that there are conditions where the air conditioner may not run, but there's a lot of moisture in the house. Once we get over into these conditions here, things tend to work all right because the air conditioner comes on, it runs a lot, and during that run time, it takes out a lot of moisture, and things tend to work out pretty well. So at design load conditions, uh, when everything's working, when the air conditioning system is working hard, you've got enough latent removal capacity to take care of this line. You can see how as we, as we come down the, the uh, chart to the left there, things get a little bit more interesting. Um, in other parts of Manual J, you find a table that looks like this. This is called a bin hour table. It just tells you how much time we spend at different um, conditions outside. 
So what you have here is, is the outside temperature bins uh, broken down in five degree, basically five degree bins, and the average annual hours of occurrence, so how much time we spend at all those conditions. Uh, I'm gonna cut that chart off right about here, and I'm gonna flip it into a, a I'll call that a table. I'm gonna turn that table into a chart that looks like this. So essentially what I did was just present that same information. I bottomed it out at 65 degrees and went up here to 100 degrees. We would design for conditions right around in here somewhere. So the 1% design condition that we choose for sizing air conditioning and heating systems is in this area here where we don't spend a lot of time. And so the next thing I'm gonna do is lay those two charts right over the top of each other and get something that looks like this. And the reason I didn't just show you this is because I thought it would be a little bit confusing. Um, but we, I talked about earlier about these conditions here where things are really interesting, where there's a lot of sensible load, but there's not a lot of latent load uh, as compared to these conditions here where there's a lot of sensible load and the air conditioning system can do a good job of removing it. The reason I wanted to show you this and interlap the times over it is because we spend a lot of time in these conditions here. Um, this is where Manual J says part load conditions are important, but the solution is designed here. Um, one of the challenges that even in a, a, a Manual J, a perfectly sized Manual J uh, air conditioner, an industry best practice, can't deal with these situations. So we have a condition here where there's a lot of time spent with, with uh, latent loads, but not a lot of sensible loads, and that's where things start to get really interesting. So I wanted to present that in a form that we could all follow it along and um, show you just kind of, as I was reading through Manual J, I found those things really interesting. And I think it presents a challenge uh, for you to understand that the HVAC guys, you know, this is what they have to work with as industry best practice. And um, uh, I, th I think there are some interesting takeaways from that. Uh, there's a big red circle over the time where we spend the most. Um, we've done some monitoring of homes and I wanted to kind of show you what this actually looks like in real life because uh, I think it's interesting as well. Um, this is just graphs of, of outside temperature uh, coming up and down in the red. You can see it gets warm during the day, it cools off at night. Kind of a typical summertime condition in a green grass climate. Um, we've also charted the outside dew point in these uh, blue lines here so you can get an idea of how that looks. Uh, here's your peak sensible load uh, that had a related point on the other chart that we looked at. Peak load here drops down not a lot of load here, back up again. So peak load up in here, these are all part load conditions along here. Um, here's your average or your peak latent load in, in these examples. So that's about a 75 degree dew point. This was about a 92 degree temperature. So you kind of see how those works, uh, how that works. It's interesting to note, I think that the, the peak latent load doesn't occur with the peak sensible load. Um, another, another challenge uh, in that real life throws to us a, that is a little bit different than the, than the design loads that we get out of the book. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of work with this graph too, just to kind of show us what our, our, our heating and cooling systems are, are challenged with. So here's a 77 degree line right across here, the, the dark red line that shows you where we wanna maintain our interior spaces in the summertime. Um, this is 50% relative humidity in the green, which is associated with a 55 degree dew point uh, in, the, in the kind of dark blue condition. So when we look at, at loads on a house, you can see that you know, this is really the peak sensible load that the air conditioner has to deal with. This is the peak latent load that the air conditioner has to deal with. All these other parts of, of the day are times when there's actually no load or when there's a, a partial load on our air conditioning system. So it just kind of shows you a little bit about, you know, if we take those, those loads that we looked at in the other, other graph and sort of look at how it really works in the real world, we get something that looks like this. Um, another thing that we did here that we found even more interesting was we added in some interior latent loads that are generated by the occupants of the house, you know, cooking, cleaning, breathing, uh, all the stuff that we do in our houses that generate um, uh, moisture inside can be added to that outside latent load because we still have to remove all these things. So now the picture gets a little bit even more interesting. And um, 
you can see that our air conditioning is, and drying systems may or may not be operating enough to really do what we need to do. And I think that's one of the real challenges in uh, HVAC design is that our air conditioning systems uh, are also the drying systems. So we had some data there that we want to present that we thought was interesting. So I'm getting close to wrapping up. Uh, Manual J acknowledges that part load conditions may lead to higher relative humidity than the interior design conditions, which might reduce uh, comfort. It could also do some other things that you guys are all aware of, create environments, microenvironments that aren't healthy, um, could potentially reduce um, durability of the homes. And we, we kind of hope that the weather cycle prevents long periods of high indoor relative humidity. And by what I mean by that is that these outside temperatures drop down. They go up, they drop down. We get a lot of air conditioning run time here. We don't get too much here. Inside relative humidity might tend to creep up here a little bit, but the air conditioner comes on again the next day and dries things off again. So we kind of look at that up and down temperature scenario to make sure that those things happen all the time. But we need to realize that that doesn't always happen. Here's a week of rain where um, your outside dew point and your outside um, temperature are about the same for a period of five days. And this is the situation that we think is one of the most challenging for any, um, any home to deal with. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of present that and let you know that, you know, it, it's our, in, in our line of work, we find that relying on the air conditioner to be the only drying mechanism in the house uh, is a real challenge. And I think some of the information that we presented there uh, will help you show that. So again, kind of just to wrap things up, uh, we think it's important to understand those design loads and how they relate to the real world conditions that we actually see. And then I think we need to recognize the challenges of those the varying loads and how that works on equipment. And we may need to consider providing additional equipment to our systems to, to really be comfortable. So that's what I have for you. I appreciate your time.